Live from Washington, D.C. for a fifth and final day of the 2020 World Bank Group IMF annual meetings. Very good morning. I'm Paul Blake, and today our focus turns to poverty, a topic core to our mission here at the World Bank. And over the next hour or so, we'll get the view from Kenya and Pakistan, Cameroon and Bangladesh, and several points beyond and in between. But before that, let's hear how the conversation extends to where you are with our very own Pabsi Mariano. Pabsi, all this week, we've been running polls online, getting people's opinions about the various topics. Today is a little bit different. We also have a quiz as part of the program. What can you tell us about that? So this quiz will be discussed in the event, but it will give us an idea, a clearer understanding of what the state of global poverty is. So just to give you a little preview, I'll read some of the questions, okay? So question one, when did the quest to end poverty suffer its worst setback? Question two, what are the three major challenges to poverty reduction? Question three, how many people live below the $5.50 a day poverty line? And question four, how many people will climate change drive into poverty by 2030. And you'll be back here, I think, in about an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes time, giving us the answers to those, uh, to those quiz questions. There's also the poll online. Tell us about that. So the poll is still up. We have a few minutes left. So the please vote on that. We are asking people, what's the most important action to take to end poverty? Fantastic. You'll have those results for us in a few minutes. The other thing, and this is one of my favorite projects, is the digital mosaic. It's a sort of collective art project. Tell us a little bit more about that and how people can get involved here in the last few minutes. So it's almost complete. Um, we're 98% there and we'll definitely reveal that image later. So people have a last few minutes to get their, get their pictures submitted. The pictures are all about what resiliency means to them. And it's quite cool. You can actually click through and see uh, photos from around the world that have been submitted and see all the different sort of personal Absolutely. definitions people have. We also have Axel von Trotzenberg, the, the Managing Director for Operations, as well as Alfonso Garcia Mora from the International Finance Corporation joining us in about an hour and 10 minutes answering audience questions. How can people submit those questions and, and what advice would you give them to make them stand out from the, the hundreds or thousands of other questions out there? So please go to World Bank Live. Um, we have the live chat there where you can ask your questions and we have colleagues monitoring these so that we will get them to our guests on the set. Um, also use the hashtag end poverty as well as resilience recovery, make it relevant for today's event, um, be concise and straight to the point. Perfect. Thank you, Pabsi. Well, there's thousands of questions and comments coming in across all of our social media channels. I'll leave you and your team to manage all of that as the rest of us turn our attention now to global poverty. For decades, global poverty was on the decline. The fight against it was a success story. But in 2020, for the first time in over 20 years, the rate will rise. To find out why poverty is on the rise and what can be done to get us back on track, I'll hand us now over to the BBC's Larry Madowo. Larry, take it away. Welcome everyone in our virtual audience around the world. We're so glad you could join us for this event on End Poverty Day 2020, Surmounting Setbacks. I'm Larry Midowell, North America correspondent at the BBC, and it's such an honor to host this event. You all agree 2020 has been such an exceptional year in so many ways. And it will be the first in over two decades that we're not able to celebrate progress on End Poverty Day. For the first time since 1998, the global extreme poverty rate, that is the percentage of the world's people living on less than a dollar 90 a day, that number will rise. The World Bank estimates that 88 million to 115 million additional people will be pushed into extreme poverty in 2020. To be sure, the rate of progress on poverty reduction was slowing even before the pandemic hit for a variety of reasons, chief among them, armed conflict and the effects of climate change. The added impact of COVID-19 means that the goal of ending extreme poverty by 2030 is now out of reach without swift, significant and sustained action. So this is a moment to learn about the increased poverty risks, to focus on supporting a resilient recovery. And we have such a stellar lineup of guests from all over the world who can help us understand the challenges and the solutions. But before I introduce our guests, 
let me remind you of the ways you can take part in this special event. We are streaming in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic on World Bank Live, where experts are taking your questions right now. Also, stay tuned for a special End Poverty Day quiz. I'll be bringing that to you shortly. But first, here's a look at what's coming up over the next hour. A very impressive lineup and a truly global one at that. We'll be linking up to guests in Kabul, London, Islamabad, Dhaka, Vancouver, and Yaoundé in Cameroon. But first, let's take a look at the challenges that confront us as we unite to end poverty. We all hope for a better future, that our children will be safer, healthier, more prosperous than the generation before. We expect progress. But we face an unprecedented challenge, the gravest reversal in global poverty reduction in a generation. The latest numbers are stark. Extreme poverty is rising for the first time in more than two decades. The goal of ending extreme poverty has been set back by at least three years. Just let that thought sink in for a moment the gravest reversal in global poverty reduction in an entire generation. So how does the international community respond to this enormous challenge? To answer that important question, I'm joined now by Axel van Trotzenberg. He's the World Bank's Managing Director for Operations. Axel has had a long and varied career at the World Bank, and the common theme has been helping low-income and middle-income countries to develop and fight poverty. Axel, thank you for joining us. Please explain the gravity and the importance of this crisis we're facing right now? Well, we at the World Bank are extremely concerned. After decades of steady progress in reducing extreme poverty, and for example, in the last decade, lifting more than half a billion people out of extreme poverty, we are seeing a reversal of this trend. And this trend uh, has come with COVID-19, where we are now estimating that between 88 and 115 million people will fall back into extreme poverty. And just to give you the dimension of the, of the problem is that is the equivalent of the population of Egypt or Vietnam or the Philippines. So clearly we are very, very concerned because what this means is that kids uh, will not go to school. We'll have a high, we will have higher mortality rates. We have less clean water. We have higher malnutrition rates. So we are seeing this in concrete indicators in health and education. And that is dramatic, that's our concern, and we should care about this. So this dramatic reversal that you talk about, is that all due to the COVID-19 pandemic? No, absolutely not. But it is certainly reinforcing uh, the problem. This is of such global magnitude, COVID-19, that we are seeing this trend. But clearly there are other factors at play as well. Um, uh, two are uh, very, very prominent is uh, conflict as well as climate change. State conflict, unfortunately, about 40% of the extreme poor are today living in conflict affected countries. And this trend is going to increase. Uh, also climate change is having a massive impact 
also on extreme poverty, particularly in the poorest countries. Unless we do something about this, we also estimate that climate change will contribute further to extreme poverty and uh, uh, between 68 and maybe 130 million people could fall into extreme poverty as a result of the effects of climate change. This is precisely the reason why the World Bank, through its uh, Fund for the Poorest, called the International Development Association, is putting so much emphasis on questions like uh, uh, climate change, like fragility. We have been doubling our effort over the last three years in investing in fragile countries. This is now reaching about $23 billion. In the next three years, we will see a further increase. Also on climate change, we are aggressively working with countries around the world to see how we can mitigate and, uh, the, uh, climate change as well as to adapt to climate change. So this are, is a huge agenda and we have to take action. You already talked about this a little, but could you just go into a bit more detail about what can be done because you've created quite a grim picture and what the World Bank is already doing? Well, there are clearly uh, two sets of actions. These are the shorter term actions as well as the longer term action. When COVID-19 exploded on the world earlier this year, uh, we made an announcement that we would like to invest in countries in the order of $160 billion between April of this year and June next year. We are well on track. We have uh, committed well over $43 billion to date. Uh, but here is first the thing is about health, saving lives. Uh, in this context, we uh, had an, a program launched earlier this year, uh, helping countries uh, right now about 111 countries are benefiting from it, from a package uh, from the World Bank Group in the order of $14 billion. And, uh, and now we have announced the next stage is namely to help countries finance vaccines. And this is a $12 billion initiative that has been uh, presented to our board. And we would like to uh, help here clearly uh, uh, countries to combat COVID with this package. But this is not enough. We have to do more on social protection. We have to do uh, more on the jobs agenda and ultimately keeping the long-term agenda. This is what we are trying to do with a fairly uh, ambitious package particularly for the poorest countries uh, that uh, are benefiting from uh, our resources for the, for the poorest. And uh, what we are expecting in these 15 months that the poorest countries will be able to receive in the order of 50 to $60 billion of, uh, of support. What concerns is for the longer term is that we need to reverse this negative trend of, 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 of increased poverty and, and also to get back on track with regard to the sustainable development goals. And that will require action by the international community, be it on the multilateral side, bilateral side, but also on the national side. And what we are making the case for is we can, in times of crisis, not leave a country's uh, that are among the poorest out of our concerns. This, there is a question of international solidarity, but it is also smart investment to help these countries back on track. That is what we are advocating, that's what we're doing every single day and what we need to continue to do so. All right, Axel, thank you so much for describing the situation and what needs to be done. Thank you. I'm Shegufta Sharia in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and you are watching World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings. Axel will also be taking part in a special live show after this event where he'll be answering your questions. Please share those questions in our live chat or by using the hashtag #EndPoverty. Okay, time now for the first of our quiz questions. Don't worry, we have made it relatively easy for you. You'll have a choice of answers. Question number one, when did the quest to end poverty suffer its worst setback? Was it A, 2020, B, 1998, or C, 2008? The next question in a moment, and all the answers will be revealed live in the show right after this event. For now, 
Let's hear from women small business owners in Colombia who are benefiting from loans from Banco de Vivienda to keep their companies afloat during the crisis and to protect the jobs they provide. This project is funded by IFC and guaranteed by MIGA. Those are members of the World Bank Group focused on the private sector. Please use the hashtag IFC Impact or Investors for Impact if you're interested in this work. Eh, somos los dueños de la ferretería, una de las ferreterías más antiguas de Neiva, llevamos casi 25 años en el mercado, pues adaptándonos a los continuos cambios. Ahora nos toca adaptarnos a la pospandemia también. Eh, más o menos se nos bajaron las ventas en un 70% y estamos ahí tratando de, de hacer que esto renazca nuevamente. Tenemos muchas, muchas expectativas. Además, eh, contamos con un buen equipo de trabajo. Nosotros en este tiempo, durante todo el tiempo de Ferre Castillo, jamás hemos tenido una demanda laboral. Tenemos inclusión mujeres igual a hombres, casi que estamos igual en, el, en, el, en, en, la, en la planta de personal. Eh, queremos también pagar. Eh, hemos hecho análisis y nosotros decimos, bueno, pero si gastamos 200 y nos toca pagar y, y, nos, y estamos haciendo 100, ¿Cómo vamos a pagar esto? Eh, igual queremos decirles a ustedes que nuestra intención es pagar, pero pensamos que con el plazo lo podemos hacer. Estamos haciendo una nueva reorganización, estamos haciendo un plan estratégico y estamos viendo que después de esto del COVID, de, de estar confinados, queremos hacer las cosas bien, queremos hacerlas y tenemos que reinventarnos. Eso sería lo que les quiero dejar y que pasen una feliz tarde. Antes de la pandemia, pues teníamos unas ventas importantes, no teníamos eh, sufrimientos en materia de liquidez. Luego del COVID-19, las empresas se han visto bastante afectadas. Gracias a Da Vivienda, hemos podido salir adelante, quienes nos han facilitado los créditos para las nóminas y cumplir con todos los compromisos y poder tener una liquidez importante y salir adelante, que el Grupo Hot tiene en su mayoría gerentes que somos mujeres. Entendemos que el rol de la mujer hoy día es muy importante para el país y para regiones como la nuestra. It is so important that we hear from those voices, right? Because that's how we can really understand the impact the policies and programs we're discussing have on the ground and how they can change lives. Those projects were led by the private sector. And now to talk more about how we can mobilize companies and business to respond more effectively to coronavirus, I'm joined by Strive Masiwa, founder of the Econet Group. Strive, you've recently been appointed as an African Union envoy to mobilize the private sector response to COVID-19. How is that work going? Well, it's not recent. I've been uh, in this job since about March and it is full time. Uh, so I stepped away from my business duties. I work full time with President Ramaphosa and six other colleagues. And our job is to coordinate the continental response. Uh, so we are in many ways responsible for many of the recommendations you have seen around the lockdowns that have taken place. Uh, the mask com campaigns, the, and of course, negotiating with the international community over debt restructuring, debt standstills, uh, trying to create fiscal space. I am responsible for ensuring that the supply chains have been sorted out so that we have supplies of medical supplies. We've done well in that respect you know, in a difficult situation. Uh, Africa's response is probably one of the best in the world in terms of containing mot the mortality. Um, but it's, it's a work in progress. There's no victory lapse with this disease. You, you work as hard as you can and hoping that we will get to the other side to vaccines uh, without much more loss of life. Now that you mentioned that, there's been a lot of speculation why Africa seems to have avoided the worst of the coronavirus compared to especially the West. What, what do you think is the reason for that? Well, if you if you like me, you wake up every day and you work very hard, uh, and we, we have worked very hard, 
And so this has been the most coordinated response of any uh, in the history of Africa to a pandemic. The heads of state, did you know, this has never happened before. There's a, there's a task force of heads of state that meets every two weeks. We as the envoys report to them. We meet every week with the health ministers, with the finance ministers. We're working pretty hard. So we know we, we, we kind of don't like it when people say, well, what, what do you think could have been the cause other than, we work hard. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but obviously, you know, historians will have their own space and others to study why it could be. Uh, but, but for us, um, you know, from day one, look, there are African countries that are just beginning to lift lockdowns. You know, we, we, we paid a high price, but we knew that if we don't move to contain it, uh, we didn't have the health in facilities and infrastructure to respond. So look, um, but you know, there, there are the factors that others can look into. So what is the role or the role that the private sector should play in managing acute crisis like COVID-19 and then in tackling longer term obstacles to poverty reduction, such as climate change and conflict? So, you, you know, you've got to look at it, uh, the, the, the multiple questions in what you're asking. Yeah. So if we're looking at the, the pandemic straight up, OK, you've got a crisis on. So the first thing you do is obviously you protect your people, you protect your employees, you ensure that they are able to, to respond and to protect their own families and their communities. So that's the first message we got through to the private sector. Secondly, uh, depending on the sector that you're in, because uh, some sectors, the, you know, if you were in tourism, for example, or hospitality, obviously there's very little you can do. But there's, there's always something you can do. They, they, you can help in, in campaigns around getting people to wear masks, supplying people with masks. Uh, so there were a lot of uh, simple things that we got the private sector to engage in. I, I, for instance, have a group of the private sector that meets, it's almost 200 strong from every single country. We meet every week. And that has banks, it has pharmaceutical companies, it has telecoms companies. So we, we, we encourage them to work together, to reach out within their sector and to discuss things they can do that are short term, that are medium term, and that are long term. Africa is key in the struggle to reduce poverty and ultimately to end it. And you're a big champion for entrepreneurship on the continent. You support young people who want to get into entrepreneurship. What is the role of young African entrepreneurs in um, ending poverty on the continent? There's no better tool to fight poverty than entrepreneurship. When young people are supported to set up businesses, they can create jobs, they can create uh, wealth, and that's how you fight poverty. It's ground zero in fighting poverty. I have um, dedicated many years of my life in, in promoting young entrepreneurs uh, to follow the path that I took as a young man myself when I was only 26 when I started my business to say, you can go out, you can do it. And we've got to give them the tools so that they can innovate, create products and services that can, um, can in future become big companies uh, that help us to deal with poverty. All right, so globally, more than half of the extreme poor are under the age of 15. What do you think, because you talked about innovation, how can emerging technologies and innovation um, help create quality education and opportunities for all these young people, especially as they come of age? Well, look, the, 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 the most important thing we must always do is to provide education. Because education is ground zero in anything that you can try to do. We want to create formal education opportunities. 
There's no avoiding that. We have to create formal education opportunities and to remind people that education doesn't stop. Even if you didn't go to school, you can still learn at 25. You can learn at 35, 45, 50. We want to create, ensure that there's formal education, but where we can't do it formally, we want to create informal education tools so that people are learning to read, to write, acquiring digital skills that can help them to uh, get jobs or to find jobs. So, 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 it's, so it's, an, it's, an, it's an ongoing piece of work. All right, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Trevor Masiwa, for your time and for your insights. My pleasure, and stay safe. You too, thank you. Thank you. I am Moses Alex Kabu in Freetown, Sierra Leone, and you are watching the World Bank IMF Annual Meetings. If you've just joined us, welcome. You're watching a special event from the World Bank Group on End Poverty Day, Surmounting Setbacks. We're discussing the big challenges to reducing extreme poverty around the world. It's the last event in these meetings, but continue to share your feedback using the hashtag Resilient Recovery. Time now for question two of our quiz. Are you ready? Good. What are the three major challenges to poverty reduction? A. COVID-19, GDP, and agriculture. B, COVID-19, climate change and conflict. Or C, armed conflict, gender inequality, and migration. There are still two more questions to come, and my co-host Paul Blake will be revealing all the answers right after this event. You may have also noticed that we're running a live poll, and you can cast your vote right now at World Bank Live. You will hear lots of guests today talking about the importance of youth, how by tackling extreme poverty, we can provide opportunities for young people. And for many, COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on education, employment, and mental health. As part of a special project, Youth on COVID, the World Bank Group has been hearing from young people around the world about their experiences, their fears, and their hopes. It's been a tough time as I know a lot of people lost their jobs as well. Past five months have been quite eye-opening for me in terms of reorganizing my life. In terms of the impact of coronavirus, it's had both a positive and a negative impact. COVID-19 has definitely had a huge impact on the Peruvian lifestyle. In my country, COVID-19 has affected how young people get jobs. 122 million people have lost their jobs in India and it especially hit really hard to the laborers and small traders who accounted for three-fourths of this number. Personally, COVID had a huge effect on my mental well-being because the only connection we have with each other is through social media. But thank God this exists. Truth be told, we are the only ones that can review Nigeria and this time we we'll review Nigeria and we are going to build back better. And we'll be hearing more of these young voices throughout the course of this event. I'm just going to quickly mention another opportunity you have. To get back on track, we must tackle three urgent global challenges. The shockwaves from the coronavirus pandemic threaten to push up to 115 million additional people into extreme poverty. In just 10 years, the effects of climate change could increase global poverty by up to 132 million. By 2030, up to two-thirds of the extreme poor could be living in fragile or conflict-affected areas. These are two massive challenges that disproportionately impact the world's poor. Let's start by focusing on the issue of conflict. Here's one statistic to get you thinking. 
The World Bank Group estimates that by 2030, countries that are affected by conflict and fragility will be home to two thirds of the world's poorest people. I'm joined now by two civil society activists who have a long experience in this field. Lemis Aliriani, who has a monitoring and evaluation unit of the Yemen Social Fund for Development and Orzala Nemet, an Afghan scholar who leads the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit. Thank you for bo both for being here. Lemis, let me start with you. We have seen that extreme poverty, the rate in Middle East and North Africa is doubling every two years, largely as a result of the wars in Yemen and Syria, and the number of the poor is growing. What can be done, do you think, to stem this tide? Um, first, and, uh, first of all, thank you for having me on. Uh, first and foremost, the war uh, in Yemen has to stop in order to stem the tide of the growing poverty. But until then, uh, the main action is to increase the support to social protection and economic recovery programs. Five years uh, of war has left 80% of the population at risk uh, of hunger and diseases. Uh, a recent report uh, from the UNDP projects that if the fight continues in Yemen through 2022, Yemen will become the poorest country in the world. Not only that, the war has uh, cost Yemen 21 years of development gains. It has affected its social fabrics. It increases um, and it increases violence against women and children, and it displaces millions of people. So uh, it's not only the extreme poverty that is being doubling, but also uh, the uh, the human and social capital because Yemenis. Uh, needs food, um, uh, access to uh, basic services such as schooling, water and sanitation, uh, healthcare, uh, income in order to safeguard their fragile economy. So the, the public servant in Yemen has to be paid, their salaries has to be paid, some of whom they haven't been, been paid for two years. Um, uh, also, um, uh, the flow of remittances has to be secured as many Yemenis uh, rely on their relatives abroad. Um, um, social protection programs has to be increased, either direct uh, cash transfer or cash for uh, work for works. And as well as uh, increased investment in economic uh, uh, opportunities and in promising sectors and increase access to financial services. Yemen's uh, also needs to link and coordinate um, uh, the um, uh, humanitarian action with development so that to mitigate the impact of uh, aid dependency and handout economy. Orzala, tell us about how the pandemic is affecting Afghanistan and how that intersects with the efforts to end conflict there and fight poverty. Thank you. Um, in Afghanistan, uh, I have to start with saying that the issue of poverty is one of the mo major uh, challenges. Uh, it is to do with uh, you know people affected by conflict that leads to migration and displacement. It's to do with people's access to basic services and people's access to jobs. And also it's to do with people's general livelihoods. Uh, there are significant increases in poverty every year, despite massive international assistance in Afghanistan throughout the years of uh, recent phases of conflict, the last two decades. I think Afghanistan uh, is on the top of the recipients of donor funded uh, assistance uh, internationally. However, the issue of poverty has not been resolved. It has not been addressed in a systematic way despite all these uh, assistance and efforts. Uh, in my opinion, one, one way of looking at poverty is to really reconsider our means of distribution of resources. There are some good examples and models that have been successful in terms of ensuring that people across the country, across regions and localities receive those aids, but the issues require systematic and more long-term commitment to work at. So Lamis, your organization has played an important role in providing cash for work programs, you build classrooms and you provide microcredits to entrepreneurs. Talk about the role that uh, organizations like the Social Fund for Development can do in fighting poverty, especially among women. 
Uh, since the start of the war, uh, SFD has focusing on delivering cash-based uh, services, uh, to either through the cash for work or the cash for nutrition, as well as supporting and sustaining the uh, SMEs. During the last five years, with support from donors, including the World Bank, SFD has reached more than 470,000 uh, households with cash-based assistance. This is about 10% of the households in Yemen. Women are the primary beneficiaries in 100% of the household benefiting from the uh, cash for nutrition. And in 42% of, uh, of the uh, households uh, benefiting from the uh, cash for works. So uh, 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 social fund is designing the cash for work uh, programs is designing components of works that it suits a woman physical capacities and mobility needs uh, in order to increase their participation. And the evaluation had showed us that there is an increase of women participation. And this tells us that um, economic necessities over, uh, override uh, uh, cultural norms that constrain women from working outside. In the cash for nutrition, uh, we have also seen that the community educators are inspiring women to uh, send their girls to schools as they are playing as a role, they are working, uh, they are, uh, they look at them as a role models. Uh, similarly, with the uh, supporting to the SMEs, uh, social fund um, affiliate microfinance institutions are designing products just to target uh, women to increase their participation. Uh, in 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 economic uh, in economic opportunities. So what we have seen that women's status are in, uh, improving in their households uh, once they become um, uh, breadwinners and they bring income to the households. Right, Orzala, you spent fourteen years as a refugee in Pakistan, fleeing the fighting in Afghanistan. In twenty nineteen there were almost 80 million people forcibly displaced worldwide, many of them from Afghanistan. What are some solutions that can help address the needs of refugees and host communities? In terms of uh, general observations related to COVID-19's impact on poverty in Afghanistan, it has affected mostly the small and medium enterprise, um, you know, businesses like carpenters, masons, daily laborers, and so forth. So the number of poor of the poorest have increased, while those who were at the bottom of the poverty line have remained the same way as they are. Uh, there are also, uh, I think, global studies uh, based on UNICEF uh, data that talks about, you know, um, uh, in terms of, you know, children being affected by this. Uh, the UNICEF study uh, in 70 countries globally is talking about 45% of children in these countries uh, severely deprived of basic services. I think that requires a serious attention by international community, particularly member states to reconsider those goals that are, are set uh, uh, globally known social uh, development, sustainable development goals uh, to, be, to, to be revisited and to really look into the new context of global pandemic and the ways it has affected particularly children, uh, poor of the poorest, and uh, uh, small and medium enterprise uh, businesses. These are really uh, serious considerations that we expect to see uh, made by um, international uh, community, particularly the member states. Now, coming to the question, uh, to the, your second question regarding the um, solutions for refugees. As you rightly mentioned, Afghanistan makes still one of the largest uh, after the Syrian conflict, we are the second, but before the Syrian conflict, Afghanistan was uh, a country with the largest number of refugees around the world. Uh, that still remains to be the case. Uh, we are second, and that means that majority of the refugees are coming from Afghanistan. Our research is highlighting the fact that it's, there is an important need to uh, consider the categorization of people who we call migrants or refugees, because the terminology really ma matters a big deal. Uh, for example, from countries at war and conflict like Afghanistan, we are dealing with several aspects of migration issues, starting from, you know, dealing with refugees or those who are leaving due to war and violent conflict to those who are internally displaced due to 
war, due to natural disasters, due to economic uh, challenges in their uh, localities. There are also issues of returnees. Uh, believe it or not, but Afghanistan is uh, having the largest number of returnees despite the ongoing conflict in the country after the Second World War, according to research and studies. Thank you to my guests, Orzawa and Lemis. Let's hear now more from our youth on COVID. In our national context, it's very difficult to adapt the system to remote working atmosphere. While I was fortunate enough to have a job and earn while at home, I knew the situation had not been seen for my fellow citizens. Some young people are beginning to feel that they are not employable. Who would have thought we would be living in an era where we had to isolate ourselves from our friends and family to keep each other safe? I think it's uh, revealed a lot of deficiencies in our public health and education system. I really want to see initiatives and projects related to helping indigenous people. They are extremely affected by the virus and because of the remoteness of their communities, it's harder to provide them with the necessary tools to fight corona. But I believe in the Filipinos. For every young person in Nigeria, my advice is we've been through a lot, we're thriving, we're growing, we're becoming stronger. I'm super proud of our frontliners. Kayo po ang bagong bayani ng ating bayan. Pag may chance tayo na matulungan ng kapwa natin, gawin natin. Laban! Let's stay with the young voices for our next video. We've heard that the impact of COVID-19 is reversing a trend that has lifted hundreds of millions out of extreme poverty since 1990. Young women in Sierra Leone are taking part in a project funded by IFC and implemented by the faith-based group World Hope to learn how to make and sell soap. Soap making not only helps protect communities from the coronavirus, but also provides an income for those most at risk of economic hardship and abuse during the crisis, women and girls. I'm in Bali talking my village do. I'm in age now 17 years. I said screw I do. The village fine, they clean, we get pump, one pump, or they need it for it, but we get pump, we get one primary school, we not get markets, we don't they not make, we need help. With the farm now, yeah, we not get lights. It's the make a happy I guess possible for supporting me with my education. I'm glad about this program very much because this program they make now to be able to get money. The parents they're not able to get the money for they go to us. But now if we make this trip here, we able to get money for pay with school fees. And we got it for that way. So they use water, show that we use medicine, country medicine. We they use that, we use color for make the soap fine. And if you say this program they make me be a somebody in life. Me where I grow up, I want to work in a bank or help my family then flow money in my country and help me with people there. Me, I want to move from this village, go to a big city, for go continue my education. We do with the past fine, and when we ready for maybe soap, we we'll go sit down, we are good, we go to the maybe soap here. And we get that money there, we get time, we say we go keep on, we go keep on, we see we need. Maker, and we are able to sit down find now now our family now because we are able to sit down and talk about boots in our life. The first one goes school is the we will talk to one we'll goes school, but if you stay in a market man, we will be in market but we are able to sit down good now and make you so we are able to stay in the community and we graduate. From where I grew up, I had my dad born me, I don't go up, I don't go school, stay at this age here. Then we will help for help, we will fight for help. For help with community, and we back to the sky for now, for the help now. For the same program, it's not all the same program, but other program for member with. I'm Alejandra de la Paz in the Dominican Republic, and you're watching World Bank Group IMF annual meetings. If you've just tuned in, you're watching the End Poverty Day event 
of the World Bank Group Annual Meetings. I'm Larry Mito. And it is time for our third quiz in our End Poverty Day quiz. And the question is, how many people live below the 550 a day poverty line? Is it A, almost 2.7 billion people, B, about 570 million people, or C, almost 3.3 billion people? How are you doing with those questions, by the way? Listen, remember to join Paul Blake right after this event because he'll have all the answers and he'll be putting your questions alive to Axel as well as IFC Vice President Alfonso Garcia Mora. Okay, so keep those coming in using our live chat. And remember to use the hashtag end poverty to share comments as well as IFC impact for thoughts around the role of the private sector in particular. We've heard how confronting conflict is so important in the fight to end poverty, right? Now, let's turn to the challenge of climate change. Another big statistic for you from the World Bank Group. Without urgent action, climate impacts could push an additional 132 million people into poverty by 2030. Yes, that's 132 million additional people. To discuss some ways we can take that urgent action and make an impact, I'm delighted to be joined from London by Sarah Colin Brander from the Overseas Development Institute. She's an environmental economist who helps policymakers develop climate compatible development strategies. I'm also glad to have Salimul Huk of the International Center for Climate Change and Development. He's in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and has written about the inner relationships between climate mitigation and adaptation. Let me start with you, Sarah. The World Bank's recent poverty report maps out how the risk of catastrophic flooding overlaps with extreme poverty. What can countries do to protect people from these risks and develop in a more climate compatible way? Thank you, Larry. The important thing to understand here is that there's not just a correlation between extreme poverty and catastrophic flooding. The two are inextricably linked. In urban areas, all households are competing for land that is well located for accessing jobs and services. Consequently, well located land is expensive because demand drives up prices. Low income households there have, therefore have a choice. They can either choose to live further away on cheaper land, which will mean they spend a lot more time and money on transport, or they can live on land that's close to the city, but otherwise undesirable, perhaps on steep slopes or near landfill. When they build houses there using concrete and asphalt, that actually increases the runoff and consequently the extent of flooding. The result is that the poorest are left to live in areas that are most likely to flood and by settling there, they actually increase the extent of that flooding. The other factor to bear in mind is that the poorest don't have access to the basic services and infrastructure that would reduce the extent or the impact of flooding. Stormwater drains, piped water, decent sanitation, weather resistant roads. Because these households cannot afford formal housing, they settle informally. And then without a legal address, they're unable to connect to water and power utilities, to open a bank account, register to vote. By virtue of their poverty, these urban residents are systematically excluded from the political and the physical infrastructure that could reduce their flood risk. Women, migrants and minorities are all especially likely to fall through the cracks. The challenge for countries facing catastrophic flooding is therefore how to tackle the fundamental drivers of vulnerability, inequality, exclusion, marginalization. Countries need to commit to meet the basic needs of everyone in the city, and particularly to give low income and other marginalized groups a voice in policy and planning. This is key to tackling flood risk, as well as the suite of other climate hazards coming down the line. All right, so Salim, climate change is a threat for all countries, but it is especially grave for the world's poorest, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. What do you think their critical adaptation priorities should be to respond to this mounting risk? Thank you very much, Larry. So I work um, at the International Center for Climate Change and Development here in Dhaka, Bangladesh, at a university called the Independent University of Bangladesh, and also in the South Asia region. And I do a lot of work in the least developed countries in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa as well. And most of my work is working with the most vulnerable communities in those countries and finding ways in which we can support them to be able to cope with the impacts of climate change, which are now becoming more severe. And in fact, I would say as of this year, 2020, we are now already living in a climate change world. This is not something that's going to happen. It's something that is happening. 
and together with the COVID-19 crisis, it's a, a double emergency for the uh, poor communities. And as Sarah said, in the urban sectors, they are particularly the ones living in the slums, but there are huge numbers of them also living in rural areas who also need to be supported and enabled and supported to be able to adapt to the incoming threats of climate change from floods to droughts to cyclones and hurricanes. And that's a lot of what I do is working with communities to enable them to be able to be better prepared to the impacts of climate change. I'm sure both of you must be frustrated when you hear climate change deniers and considering how grave this is. Real quick for both of you, Salim first. Sure, so I tell my friends in the US and other countries where they have a, a plethora of climate change deniers, send them to Bangladesh and I'll show them climate change and they'll have to believe it. I think I have a similar strategy to Salim. You can probably tell from my accent that I'm Australia, Australian. And of course, Australia was absolutely devastated by catastrophic wildfires at the start of this year. I think that those in Australia might now choose to downplay the risk of climate change, but no one who saw those bushfires raging can still deny it. All right, Sarah. So what do you, th do you think are the most important steps countries now need to take so that we emerge from the COVID-19 crisis into a more climate smart and resilient recovery? Uh, unfortunately, Larry, I think the first thing we need to do is recognize that it's going to be some time until we emerge from the COVID crisis and that millions of people are sinking into poverty now. Uh, the World Bank's new report actually highlights that 100 million people will fall into extreme poverty this year as a result of the pandemic. So the question is, firstly, what can we do to protect those people from hunger, from eviction, from missing out on education? Protecting them today as the crisis persists will not only avoid an awful lot of unnecessary suffering, but also make it easier in the near future to deliver a climate smart and resilient recovery. Uh, looking forward, the World Bank's report also underscores that these new poor are going to be more urban, as Salim said, uh, better educated and less likely to work in agriculture than those before the pandemic struck. While cities have been struck earlier and harder by COVID-19, cities are also going to be the engines of economic and human development going forward. Done right, the density and proximity of cities also offers a chance to deliver a high quality of life with a smaller environmental footprint. The most important thing for countries to do now then is to target their policies accordingly, based on who has suffered and where a recovery can happen fastest and strongest. Two billion people live in informal settlements today and cities in Asia and Africa are expected to swell by a further two billion people in the next 30 years. Our global challenge is to find ways to boost the living standards and resilience of these urban residents and to do so in a way that is resource efficient. It's, it's not a small challenge. Uh, it's going to require an integrated and a far-sighted approach to all manner of policies, social protection, infrastructure investment, urban planning, industrial strategy, and all of that with a close eye on carbon budgets and biodiversity conservation. But if we don't deliver inclusive and sustainable cities, we're going to fail on both poverty and on climate change. So that's where we need to drive forward our resilient recovery. Right, Salim, as you already mentioned, Bangladesh has been at the forefront of climate change impacts, everything from cyclones, high temperatures, floods. And in July this year, a quarter of the country was flooded. That's impacted millions of people. How does this affect efforts to reduce poverty? And are there any policies that you think can help com um, communities address these challenges? Well, it's a huge challenge for a country like Bangladesh, one of the most vulnerable to the impacts of climate change but we haven't been sitting idle. The country has developed uh, a climate change strategy and action plan. Everybody from the prime minister down to the people on the street, all are familiar with climate change. They're all being better prepared. They're trying to build their resilience as we speak right now. And I'll just give you one metric. We had a, a huge super cyclone called Amphan a couple of months ago that in past decades had actually killed tens of thousands of people. This one only killed a few dozen people because we were successful in evacuating more than two and a half million people who got out of the path, took cyclone, took shelter in cyclone shelters and were able to come out. They still did a lot of damage, but the lives lost has been brought down to practically zero. And that's probably the best cyclone warning system in the whole world. So even though Bangladesh is a poor country and people are poor, if they know what to do, they can reduce the impacts of climate change very significantly. And this is true for other developing countries as well. 
Brilliant. We'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Salim and Sarah, my guests. Let's now turn to the young people who've been sharing their experiences and thoughts about living in this pandemic. I think the best way for us to quickly recover from this would be to scale up our innovation, especially in um, our health and education. They will have to invest in infrastructure to ensure that these people have access to basic amenities. Job opportunities and online education or trainings, especially for low-income families. We're also investing, you know, of course, giving young people the right skills. When it comes to education, I think we should start considering how to um, teach or instruct more in the local languages. To really cope up with this situation, I think our government needs to bring in schemes to help this more vulnerable sector who have lost their livelihoods. Loan opportunities for those who aspire to build a local business or even those businesses who were already affected by the pandemic. Ensuring that you know, young people have access to loans for as many that are looking to start their businesses. Additional medical staff and support and supplies. And economic reforms to revive the industries to provide employment. A big thank you to all the young people who submitted those videos. We've heard some really inspiring thoughts and ideas there. So we've heard from developing countries, but the developed countries also have an important role to play. The United Kingdom was a founding member of the World Bank and remains an important and influential partner in global efforts to end poverty. Last month, Dominic Raab added development to his title, and he's now the United Kingdom Secretary of State for Foreign, Commonwealth, and Development Affairs. We asked him what role developed countries should play in combating COVID-19, climate change, and conflict, and what actions they can take to help build a resilient recovery. This is what he said. I'm really grateful to be invited to speak to you all on End Poverty Day 2020, in what is clearly a pivotal year. We welcome the World Bank's recent Poverty and Shared Prosperity Report and their continued prioritization of eradicating extreme poverty. The world's made tremendous progress in our lifetime with the global population living in extreme poverty falling from one in three in 1990 to less than one in 10 today. Tragically, the COVID-19 pandemic has taken the lives of over a million people. It's thrown our economies into recession. It's led to a rise in extreme poverty for the first time in over two decades. That's got to be a wake up call for all of us. The pandemic adds to the challenges already facing the bottom billion. Conflict and climate change are pushing people further into crisis. And poverty is becoming more concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa and more fragile states, with new pockets of poverty emerging elsewhere as well. In the UK, we recognise our common collective interest in tackling these challenges. We've already allocated over 50% of our aid budget to fragile and conflict-affected states. We're investing heavily in global health and climate resilience and in the research and technology that underpins effective policy making. We support the efforts to improve health and education, particularly our campaign for girls' education. And we support countries as they integrate into the global economy so they can create jobs for their population, particularly young people. But there are limits to what we can achieve by states acting on their own individually. So the UK Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office support a renewed and rejuvenated multilateralism. We want to strengthen the international institutions that help countries tackle together the common threats that they can't tackle on their own. And together, our aim must be that this time next year we'll have succeeded together in containing COVID-19 and restoring the trajectory of sustained and sustainable poverty reduction. This is Vera Rosauer in Nairobi, Kenya, and you are watching the World Bank Group IMF annual meetings. It is finally time for our final question or a quiz. Are you excited? I am. And remember, the answers will be coming in our show at the end of this event. So question number four, how many people will climate change drive into poverty by 2030? Is it A, between 68 million and 132 million? Is it B, between 23 million and 57 million? Or C, at least 100 
and 53 million. Remember, there's still time to cast your vote in our online poll. The question we're asking is, what is the most important action to take to end poverty? Our final guest today, Dr. Sanya Nishtar, has direct experience of fighting poverty on the front lines. She is a federal minister for poverty alleviation and social safety in Pakistan and joins us from Islamabad. Dr. Nishtar, thank you for being here. You have worked for many years in fields of poverty alleviation and public health. Please explain how these two intersect, particularly in the middle of this current COVID-19 pandemic. Well, poverty and public health are deeply and inextricably linked. Uh, and to begin with, we must appreciate that per capita income has one of the strongest association with health status achievement. Um, the poor are also disproportionately exposed to a variety of risks uh, when it comes to access to clean water or sanitation or the situ status of their dwellings or the environmental risks. They're disadvantaged on all these fronts. Um, they also have poorer access to health care, both in geographic access terms and in financial access terms, and they're more likely to be pushed further into poverty and suffer catastrophic risks. But specifically in terms of COVID-19, we're clear that the poor are more exposed to the risk of the contagion because they live in overcrowded conditions. They have limited access to water for hand washing they are also more likely to use public transport and be engaged in jobs that will not allow work from home. Um, when, when it comes to the illness, um, they suffer from the direst consequences um, and they also lack savings to cope with the loss of income. Uh, and in terms of the long-term consequences of, co of COVID-19 pandemic, the poor people also suffer disproportionately. And just to give you an example, poor ch children are disadvantaged in terms of distant learning activities. They have less access to internet and television. And uh, so the higher rate of dropout and longer term consequences are quite inevitable. You recently launched the SRS program. What can other countries learn from Pakistan's social safety nets? And have you scaled up the SRS program in this COVID-19 uh, pandemic? Yes, uh, so SARS is the government's new multi-sectoral poverty alleviation uh, program. It's got over 140 elements that are linked by theory of change and they target different disadvantaged groups. We spent about a year developing the institutional infrastructure, which also included several um, digital backbones, which we were able to leverage as we scaled it up during uh, COVID-19. And we use that digital infrastructure to, um, to run a SAS emergency cash, uh, which was the emergency cash operations through which the government reached out to 15 million households with a package of $1.25 billion. Uh, and each family received an equivalent of $75. The specific lessons uh, that we learned while uh, executing that program had to do with learning new ways of doing things in this age of protracted emergency. We now have deep know-how in designing and implementing a massive national flow program in, in a context of complexity and uncertainty with speed. Um, this, this experience has helped us fast track the adoption of cost-effective digital ways of working and new ways of coordinating across multiple stakeholders um, and it has led us to believe that it is possible for the government to embrace innovation and deliver with dignity and integrity at scale. You're a medical doctor. So what prescription would you give to governments to deal with this COVID-19 pandemic and go back to a resilient recovery? So in 2017, one of, I was one of the three shortlisted candidates for the position of Director General of the World Health Organization. And my favorite statement used to be, when I used to campaign that there are three things which can destroy the world, and one of them is a pandemic. Uh, and I always used to get very perplexed looks around the table um, because the ministers of health and, le and leaders within countries were somehow unwilling to believe that such a situation could actually unfold, and now it has. So I think that uh, going forward, we will have to take the health security dimension uh, in the human development and in the human capital paradigm very seriously. 
Uh, we have to be cognizant that the international health regulations are a legally bind treaty and, it's the, and it has obligations for governments with which they must comply. Um, more generically, health system reform is going to be very much on the cards uh, as we get out of the crisis. Uh, but we have to be cognizant that a lot of measures related to health systems reform are outside of the competence of the health system and countries will have to think, uh, rethink sustainability and welfare and the role of government within that framework. Uh, the role of transparency and accountability and uh, fiscal space for social policies and, and, and all these things will have to uh, receive the kind of attention that governments have not been uh, willing to give um, uh, as we go forward. Uh, but in the short term, we have to be cognizant that the pandemic is still not behind us. So learning from my country's experience, there are a number of uh, recommendations. Uh, you know, the all of society response, strong leadership, clear communication. Right. Uh, and we have to utilize all the tools we have presently to quell the pandemic. Uh, and be part of um, COVAX along with other 168 member states to uh, to ensure that we have access to safe and effective vaccines uh, whenever they become available. All right. Dr. Sanya Nishtar there, thank you. And that, by the way, brings us almost to the close of our event today on End Poverty Day 2020. A big thank you to all my guests who joined us from all around the globe and shared their thoughts on how to build a resilient recovery from the crisis we're in right now. Our final guest has a very special message. Ngwashi Christabel Afalung is an inspiring young doctor from Cameroon and an activist for women's health and strengthening community and preventive healthcare. As a medical doctor in Cameroon, I am so shaken by the tragedies I have witnessed, especially practicing in one of the conflict affected regions. I am now seeing how the COVID-19 pandemic is upending lives. In my first year in medical practice, when the violent conflict just started in my country, I received a 34-year-old pregnant woman in my hospital. Her husband had carried her on his back and traveled miles because the local health centers were closed and there was no means of transportation as a result of the conflict. By the time they got to the hospital, the woman and her baby were dead. That was the first time I actually witnessed a man cry like a baby. Sadly, she's one of the thousands who have lost their lives in conflict. Millions of people in my country continue to struggle to overcome the shadows of conflict. And on top of that, coronavirus is destroying livelihoods. The poorest are affected the most because they are losing jobs and they have no access to quality health care. As a result of years of mismanagement and corruption, people have lost trust in the healthcare system. Healthcare professionals, like my colleagues and I, are continuously being attacked. There are lessons we can learn on how countries can better respond to pandemics like COVID-19 and conflict. We need to ensure that we don't repeat the same mistakes next time the pandemic strikes. We need to learn from this experience tackle the foundational issues and ensure that we build systems that are resilient enough to withstand these challenges. We need to prepare comprehensively and proactively. Let's act urgently and build for the future. Thank you. Thank you to Dr. Ngwashi for ending on such an inspiring note. I want to say a special thank you to you in the audience for listening, participating, and learning. It doesn't end here, of course. Stay tuned to hear your questions answered live and to find out how you did in our End Poverty Day quiz. I wanna take you over now to Paul Blake, who is live in the atrium of the World Bank Group's headquarters in Washington, DC. Back 
live in the World Bank Group Atrium for the fifth and final day of the 2020 annual meetings. I'm Paul Blake and we'll have answers to those quiz questions in a few minutes. But first, it's time to get your questions answered here on this In Poverty Day 2020. To do that, we have Axel von Trotzenberg. He's the Managing Director for Operations here at the World Bank Group, as well as the International Finance Corporation's Alfonso Garcia Mora, Vice President for East Asia and the Pacific. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming in to talk to World Bank Live. Thanks. Axel, can I start with you? We've got a question from Aliyah Yaros, and she's curious about the definition of poverty. And we have these sort of clinical technocratic definitions, $1.90, $5.50, that we use to measure these things. But what, what does poverty mean for real people you know, on the ground who are, who are suffering, especially during a pandemic? Well, uh, the most famous is the definition of uh, 190 per day. It's basically people who have not uh, access to the bare necessities of life, meaning water, electricity, education, uh, also good health care. Uh, and then, uh, and, and this is to give you a dimension, uh, we have made good progress over time to uh, get this down. And we were about uh, at about a bit over 600 million people living under 190 per day. That is still the equivalent of the entire population of Latin America. So still wow. a big chart. The tragedy of this year and of COVID is that that good trend downwards is being reversed and that we are seeing a spike up. And depending how deep this uh, COVID crisis will be for the entire 2020, we are estimating that probably uh, between 88 and 115 million people will be added again to these extreme poor. That is also, again, that is about the equivalent of the population of, of Egypt or Vietnam or the Philippines. So it gives a good uh, dimension how dire the situation is. And then there are people who are above that level but are still also poor. And for example, in the case of Mexico, where in the upper 40s uh, before COVID uh, of the percent where people are living in poverty, our estimates are now that over half of the population of Mexico will live uh, in poverty. Like, not in extreme, but still in poverty. I mean, when you compare it to the size of whole countries, I mean, that, it just really puts it in perspective of how stark the, the, you know, the, the name reversal of fortunes, uh, you know, we understand where it comes from. Let's talk a little bit about the eradication of poverty. We had decades of progress there. So that's being reversed. We've got a question from Connie on World Bank Live for you, Alfonso. She is curious about the respective roles of the public sector and the private sector when it comes to eradication of poverty. Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. And, uh, and we know that we need both. We need the public and the private sector to, 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 when, when thinking about how to solve this, uh, this issue. You know? Public sector, at least on three different dimensions. First of all, uh, to really create the environment, to really create the market, to really create the conditions for the private sector to operate, to create jobs, to in a way preserve and create new jobs. Second, public sector, because we need uh, the public sector to create the safety nets, the needed safety nets, cash transfers, etc., to really uh, protect those that are more vulnerable. And third, public sector, because we need some basic infrastructure that needs to be done by the public sector, because it will not be feasible for the private sector to do those infrastructures. But at the same time, we know that the fiscal space in the public sector is very limited, especially now in the context of, it, of this COVID-19. And there is where the private sector needs to come strongly. The private sector needs to come providing the uh, services, providing the infrastructure, creating the conditions to really allow uh, this uh, growth to, 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 to happen in an inclusive way. No? So Axel mentioned before, the need for uh, uh, access to electricity, for access to finance, access to healthcare, this needs uh, to bring the private sector to find solutions for, uh, for this part of the population. No? We have almost one billion people without access to electricity. It is impossible that this will be provided by the public sector. We have 65% of adults in the poorest countries that do not have access to finance, to any sort of finance. So it is very difficult to think on how to eradicate poverty if we don't really construct the necessary conditions for this uh, to, be happen, uh, to happen and to, and to eradicate this and to solve these problems, basic problems that, uh, that we face in many countries. No? And, and to have a recovery without electricity or without financing is, is going to be difficult if not. Involved. Exactly. And at the end of the day, we know that the best tool to fight against poverty is to create entrepreneurship is to really allow entrepreneurship to happen, no? because this is where people will be, uh, uh, will have the capacity to go up and to go out of poverty. No? And Axel, we got a question from Jorge Corman in Peru. He's curious about the bank's response to COVID-19, particularly how uh, our, our operations have changed um, and, and how we've responded to COVID-19 here over the past few months. Well, first, uh, during times of crisis, what we have learned is that as an international organization, but in general, 
you need to uh, act fast, decisively, and at scale. This is a global problem, require a global approach, so we need to really massively scale up. So, and that is what we did. That was the first announcement what we made, is that we said we will do over a 15 months period, uh, the World Bank Group will commit about $160 billion, well realizing that uh, we need to make that contribution to make a difference. Secondly, in terms of substance, you need to redirect uh, uh, your priorities meaning you will need to uh, focus on the health challenges that we, we did in the, in the first uh, 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 phase where we have supported about 111 countries that was pri uh, providing financing that they could uh, uh, buy uh, PPE, the, the, the health uh, uh, ventilators, all the things that are related to the COVID crisis. We are now entering into the second wave and it is looking at the uh, vaccines, the, there are vaccines under development and the countries will need financing. So we this week have also announced that the World Bank will make available up to $12 billion for countries to be able to buy uh, vaccines if and when they become available. Secondly, what we need to support them is also to build the infrastructure that you deploy and deliver. These are often very sophisticated. You need cold chain uh, infrastructure to do so. And many of the developing countries don't have it. So we need to do that as well. So that is on the health part. Then you need to look at social protection. Many people have been uh, hurting, many people have been laid off, many people have been pushed into poverty. So we need social protection programs. So we have uh, developed uh, uh, programs for billions and billions of dollars from, uh, from Asia to Latin America to Africa to support that. Third, you need to look at how you can protect jobs. And that uh, Alfonso was saying, how can you work together with the private sector to see that people can preserve their own? And finally, despite the, the crisis, you cannot lose sight of the longer term of the development challenges. And that we, we will remain very much focused on. And we need to basically make sure that there will be a resilient and inclusive recovery. And for that, you need also to provide investments. In all, this is what the bank is doing. We're working overtime to do so. And what is most important, the attitude is passion. Now, Axel has just given us this, this broad overview. Let's dive into a little bit of how the private sector, uh, you, how you guys have been responding to help the private sector uh, sort of cope in the short term with the pandemic but also how the IFC is working with the private sector to make it more resilient to future shocks for the next right. pandemic, the next natural right. disaster, the next right. big economic shock. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? And that question comes from Nilbert uh, Orega on World Bank Live. Yeah, so I think, that, as I mentioned before, the key thing now is job preservation, how we preserve jobs, how we avoid the job destruction that we are seeing all over the places. No? And, uh, and how we support the private sector to, uh, to deal with this uh, uh, difficult context. And I think that there are three key areas that IFC is working very, very hard together with the bank. The first one is financing. So at the end of the day, keep the lights on is a key message that we have tried, uh, World Bank Group, to maintain, to providing financing uh, with uh, specific liquidity facilities to existing clients, to SMEs, to financial institutions, to governments to cascade this uh, financing to the private sector to make sure that liquidity is there and that those that do not have access to liquidity in, in, uh, from other sources can really uh, maintain their businesses because liquidity is there for them. This is very important because we, 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 we saw in March, at the beginning of the crisis, that central banks pumped a lot of liquidity into the market. But probably this liquidity didn't actually go to those segments that actually needed it the most because they didn't have the capacity to have access to this liquidity. So the role of IFC and the World Bank to facilitate this, this uh, transmission of liquidity was critical. But the second one also related to financing is the risking. So creating conditions in a way reducing the uncertainty that the private sector sees when they need to invest into, into some projects. And there, there is a role to play. For for the World Bank and for IFC uh, to really uh, mitigate the credit risk that uh, private investors may see in some countries or in some sectors. So this is the first bucket. The second one is restructuring, and this is key. And this is key now, and this is going to be key in the next months to come. So we know that corporate restructuring is going to be 
are very important going forward for the private sector. Estimations uh, are, uh, say that probably that we will see 25 percent of SMEs uh, shutting down uh, their, 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 their doors because uh, they will not be able to maintain their activity in the, in the next uh, in the following in the next months. And therefore, the restructuring of these firms is going to be critical. It's going to be critical because we need to have a quick restructuring. We need to facilitate the insolvency regimes. We need to facilitate that these people that have the uh, small firms or medium firms, they can close them and open a new one. So we need to really facilitate this quick restructuring of the corporate sector. And that is, that, that is going to be absolutely critical because this will be the key of the recovery phase. No? And the third piece is the transition, transition to a, the, the digital world. No? What we are seeing all over the world is, is fascinating in a way, no? is how firms are really transitioning so fast from a traditional way of operating to a digital way of operating, no? related to trade, related to logistics, related to retail business, related to all the key issues that the private sector or many firms were doing in a different way before the COVID-19. No? So these three areas we believe are critical and there is where IFC is really working hard together with the World Bank uh, to, to, to help our uh, client uh, countries no? from uh, both uh, public and, and private sector clients. And it's really important because the, the private sector, as you said, is going to be so important for the recovery. Just as we wrap up here, Axel, you mentioned a few minutes ago the the vaccine, uh, the the vaccine facility that was approved this, by the board this week. I've got a question from Abdul Toure in Senegal, and he's asking if you can clarify the contribution of the World Bank uh, in in the provision of vaccines and the distribution of vaccines, particularly on the African continent. What, what will our work be? Well, first of all, uh, Africa has become increasingly important for the World Bank. Right now, about 36 percent of all our resources are directed uh, to Africa. What does that mean uh, 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 concretely in a period since the COVID crisis erupted between April of this year and, and June next year? We are estimating that uh, uh, two-thirds of the concessional resources are going to Africa and and so we need to see this as a comprehensive response not only a partial response with regard to vaccines with regard to vaccines we have made uh, that, uh, that declaration and that endorsement from the board of an envelope now the concrete projects have to follow what is clearly one of the difficulties is that we still don't know which vaccine will uh, uh, be uh, approved so there there are uncertainties about it. What is certain is we need to build the infrastructure. We're certain we need to strengthen the health, health system. Sorry. Uh, that's, that's technology. <laughs> uh, and, and therefore, what we need to make sure is working with governments, with other multilateral organizations like the WHO, like Gavi, to make that happen. At the end of the day, this crisis is again a call for international solidarity and international action. So the bank is part of that global coalition to make it happen. And so what we hope is certainly that with the money, with the technical assistance and with the international cooperation, we can actually help the African countries to uh, to overcome also this crisis but what is more is it is not only the health crisis that is affecting Africa it is uh, a, 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 the country is affected uh, uh, by fragility by the economic fallout so what we are saying is more is needed we are uh, uh, front-loading uh, our concessional resources and putting $35 billion out for, for the poorest countries. But what we are arguing is we need more. And what we are making the case towards also the donors that we would like to uh, look for supplemental emergency assistance, particularly for Africa, to the tune of $25 billion, so that in the next two years, uh, Africa can receive adequate amounts of international support. Helping them get the support they need. Axel and Alfonso, thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I'm John Rosinos in Athens, Greece, and you're watching the World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings. Well, as a reminder, we'll have Pabsi back live with me in a few minutes with answers to our quiz, results of our poll, and to reveal our digital mosaic. But first, it's time for our trip around the world, highlighting the development challenges and triumphs of individual countries. Like yesterday, today we're on a multi-destination journey, and we start off in Rabat, Morocco, where country director Yesko Henschel talked to my colleague, colleague Srimathi Shrider about the bank's work in Morocco. We have a very strong partnership with Morocco, and we've had it for decades. 
Um, currently, we have a country partnership framework, which is uh, normally a four or five year plan, uh, a strategy in which we outline with the countries, with the governments, what are the major strategic pillars we have. And we have three here, which is jobs, human capital, and territorial development. One sentence on each one of them. Uh, Morocco has had a very good development path over the last 10 or 20 years. Very intensive in investment, in infrastructure investment. Some of the most modern infrastructure you can think about, a TGV between Casablanca uh, and Tangier. However, that development pattern did not come with the number and the type of jobs necessary for an emerging market economy really to move through middle income and also to provide future and hope for its young population. This is why jobs is crucial. Second, human capital. Our listeners will be familiar with the human capital index. Currently in Morocco, that's 0.5, which means that kids born today, so babies born today, will, if the current circumstances persist, only be able to reach about 50% of their productive potential by the, by the age of 18. And especially learning is so crucial for that. So this is why human capital is our second pillar. And third, territorial development. Like in many countries, but especially so in Morocco, these divergence, this difference, the inequality between the West, which I talked about, the TGV, and the Eastern and Southern provinces are really stark. So service delivery, enabling local governments, is really important. Just two features, if I may, of what makes this program, in my view, really, really interesting. One, it's very results-based. We're using financing very often in order to support and disperse against results that are achieved. So if the teacher is in school, if the health service actually works, if the, if the road is built and operating. So this results focus is something which is very strong in the portfolio. And second, I think as the World Bank, a good part of our value added for countries is that we ask and talk about very difficult questions. And I think the relationship we have here with the country is exactly that. They're asking us to work on very difficult questions, social contract, trust, uh, reform of SOE. So both of these, I think, mark a very mature relationship we have with the Kingdom of Morocco. Well, Jesko, I think this background is so important because right now the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting all of us on a global scale and countries have had to respond rapidly and in their own way. Now, Morocco has been using some innovative financing instruments such as the catastrophe deferred drawdown option. So tell us more about that and what the impact on that has been. Good. So COVID, as you mentioned, it's, it's a global phenomenon and also it, it has hit Morocco very hard. We have now a gross projection of minus 6% with about a million jobs having been lost in the formal sector and another 4 million uh, probably in the, in the informal sector. At least people don't have the level of income they used to have before the crisis. So a massive, a massive impact. And what we were able to do, as you just referred to it, at the very beginning in April, we were able to use this CAT TDO, this catastrophic deferred drawdown option. So what is this? Think about an insurance line. It's, it's a credit line, which uh, the, the holders, or here the, the Kingdom of Morocco, the government can draw if a catastrophe happens. And originally this was for floods and earthquakes, but we were able, the team was able to restructure this and also cover the pandemic. So we were able to provide $275 million of support for budgetary outlays at the very beginning of the pandemic. Also, we were able to use about $50 million from an ongoing health project and also from the fast track COVID facility to help uh, the, the government and the health sector, especially in case management and uh, PPE, so the protective equipment, and really restart and in April um, with uh, supporting the response from the health sector side. Now we're working on a very large social protection uh, a program which would support especially cash transfers to the informal sector workers. There's about 4 million people uh, in our households, depending on the informal sector. This was something very innovative, and we're able to support this and also keeping kids in school through the existing conditional cash transfer programs. Last point, 
I think our World Bank's value added in such situations is also on the analytical and especially on the data side. So we're working with the Stats Institute, with companies, with other stakeholders and trying to get good uh, real-time information, which will help also public policymakers to target their programs and to develop their programs uh, in, in the right way. So Yesco, this is all very fascinating because amongst other things, Morocco is home to the massive Warzazet solar power generator. So tell us more about that. When did it launch and what has its impact been? It is just a massive solar power plant, uh, which is 200 kilometers south of Marrakesh. Nur is actually the Arabic word for light. And it is a 580 megawatt solar panel plant which delivers energy to 1 million households. And then really what I believe is, is so important from a development perspective, it uses local industry. 30% of the kind of building materials were really used locally. Second, it has a component on local development. So working with the communities in this quite poor otherwise uh, area of Morocco. And third, it really boosts human capital because it has training and everything else in it. Uh, it is one of the biggest also public-private partnerships because what it was had done, it was publicly designed and implemented, but it was really private companies that built it. So uh, I think this is a, a really the future for Morocco and the world because it obviously goes to a huge public policy. We need to change the way we produce and we consume energy, given what's happening all over the world, including in California right now. Let's keep talking about the future here, Yesko. I mean, right now, you and I are talking in the context of the 2020 annual meetings, but the next annual meetings are actually slated to be hosted in Morocco. So tell me more about that. What do you expect? Well, I think the, the excitement was already large before COVID, and then it kind of mellowed off a little bit because we were all gearing up to these Marrakesh meetings, which would happen in one year from now, in the fall of 2021. Really important for Morocco, for North Africa, for Africa, for emerging market economies like Morocco that are open, that want to use also examples from other countries. Um, the, the, we have a great counterpart committee that and we're all hoping so much that COVID is, is uh, over by then to the degree that we can actually sit together um, and have really a big development conference, which is what annual meetings are. And among one of the big topics, think about, well, what is the impact of COVID on development and on development policy globally? We have massive changes, massive impact, and we, we need to rethink many of the things which we thought before the crisis were given. And now, Yesko, before I let you go, one last question. Tell me, what gives you hope when you think about the work that you're doing? Well, what gives me hope and energy is going and seeing the way we and the teams work on development with our partners. So if I go to Marrakesh, we have a program that works with dropouts from secondary school and tries through apprenticeships, formal, informal ones, just get them started in some type of uh, job where they have a future. That, that gives me hope. If I go to Ilmichil, which is in the high Atlas Mountains here, and I visit a, a little cooperative, an agricultural cooperative, um, which is, is gives sustainable income to, to farmers. What gives me hope is actually Nur Zazazat, because they're and the way it was done, that is development for the future. That gives me big um, hope and, and energy. The brainstorming meetings we have, where people come with their ideas, their knowledge, their vision, this is what makes this organization work. So that gives me a lot of energy and also hope for, for the future. Yesko, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. That was Yesko Henschel, the contradictor for Morocco with the World Bank Group. Back live in the atrium now here at the World Bank Group headquarters with Pepsi Mariano. Over the past hour, we've had this quiz running throughout the program where we've been asking key questions about the state of global poverty. So, Professor Pepsi, take us through it question by question. Okay, let's see, Paul, how much you know about global poverty. Okay. Question one, 
When did the quest to end poverty suffer its worst setback? Is it A, 2020, B, 1998, or C, 2008? So I grew up in the United States, and the global financial crisis was a, was a huge issue in, in, in sort of my, my upbringing. And I can imagine that was definitely a setback. But COVID-19 has, has been just so much more international, so, you know, hitting no country sort of spared. So I'm going to go with 2020 on that one. So that is correct. Okay. It's A, 2020. Now, right. Question two. What are the three major challenges to poverty reduction? Is it A, COVID-19, GDP, and agriculture, B, COVID-19, climate change, and conflict, or C, armed conflict, gender inequality, and migration? So considering that 2020 was the answer to the first one, because of presumably because of COVID-19, I'm imagining it's going to be A or B. It's going to include COVID-19, GDP, agriculture, or climate change conflict. I'm going to go with a, GDP and agriculture? So you almost got it, but the correct answer is B, COVID-19, climate change, and conflict. It's easier to remember them as the three Cs. The three Cs, okay, yeah. I'll remember that one. So, okay, question three. How many people live below the $5.50 a day poverty line? Is it A, almost 2.7 billion people, B, about 570 million, or C, almost 3.3 billion? So we had Axel here just a few minutes ago, and he was talking through some of those definitions. $5.50, that, mm -hmm. I, if I recall, is the one of the higher sort of thresholds to, to measure poverty. So imagine there would be more people who live under that. So I'm imagining it's going to be one of the ones in the billions. Let's go with 3.3 billion people. That is correct. The answer is C, almost 3.3 billion people. Okay. So I've, I've got two right, one wrong so far. One last question. Okay. The final question is, how many people will climate change drive into poverty by 2030? Is it A, between 68 million and 132 million, B, between 23 million and 57 million, or C, at least 153 million? Going to go with A, 68 million to 132 million. Is that that correct. is correct. The answer is okay. A, between 68 million and 132 million. Okay, so I've got a little bit of studying to do. Three out of four correct. Um, so beyond this quiz, we also have a poll running. And the question we're asking people to give us their opinion on is what is the most important action to take to end poverty? And the, the, the possible answers are, is it cash transfers to the poor? Is it building industries and creating jobs? Is it better education and skills? Is it perhaps option D, insurance against risks such as natural disasters? You've been crunching the numbers. How many people have voted and what have they said? So regarding numbers, I have to mention that this poll, we got the most votes out of all the polls we've uh, been running the entire week. A total of 10,335 total votes across all our platforms on this poll. Wow. So and that, thank you that very compare? much, everybody. How does that compare to the, to the previous days? So the previous days, we've gotten 6,000, 5,000. So you can imagine how people responded to this poll. Yeah. So the top answer, getting 55% of the votes, is better education and skills training. All right, Pepsi, well, stay with me. We'll be revealing the digital mosaic here in a few minutes, and that's made up of over 1,500 images, you were telling me. We'll have the exact number in a few minutes, but it's contributed by audience members around the world. It's my favorite project. But first, it's time to continue our journey around the world with the second leg, and we're off to Indonesia, specifically to the capital city of Jakarta, where country director Satu Kakonen recently spoke to me about the bank's work in Indonesia. Indonesia has achieved significant results in the past decade. Um, economy has continued growing steadily. Poverty has declined to below 10% and incomes of the bottom 40% of the population have increased. What is the bank doing to help with both the short-term response, but also help Indonesia enact a sort of sustainable uh, recovery going forward? The World Bank has supported Indonesia, first of all, to address the short-term response to the pandemic. Uh, we prepared an emergency package that covered uh, support to the health sector to equip the hospitals uh, with equipment and facilities to respond to the, to, to, the, to the pandemic. We also supported the government 
to expand the social protection uh, program, to cover more people, and also to expand the cash transfer benefits. And thirdly, we have supported government on an emergency basis uh, with the financing to their fiscal stabilization efforts. But that's, that's not the only thing we have done. We have very quickly shifted also to work with the government on the longer term recovery efforts. And that's where our support is focusing now. Uh, we are trying to help the government to move forward with reforms that would accelerate the economic recovery. I mean, all crises are dooms and glooms. They do hurt the people. But crises are also opportunities for change. And that's what we are trying to do in Indonesia, help country take advantage of the crisis to change and as a result to have the country continue to shine. And, and I mean, as you've laid out, I think at the top of this, and, and certainly I think people who, who know the work of the World Bank in Indonesia would know, Indonesia has been a success story, especially on human capital fronts, especially when it comes to stunting. Do you worry that, that COVID has really you know, created tremendous reversals in some of these gains? And, and what do you think the sort of future holds for some of these gains that, that have been achieved on the development front in Indonesia? Indonesia has achieved a lot in the past few years uh, in the area of human development. Stunting has reduced, access to health services has improved, access to education has improved, and also poverty has reduced to below 10%. But as a result of the pandemic, uh, many people have either lost their jobs or faced reduced incomes. And we are estimating now that up to 8 million additional Indonesians may fall into poverty in 2020. And this would happen if there's no additional social assistance. Now, luckily, the government has a robust social assistance system, and they have raised cash transfers to the to households during the pandemic, which means that the poverty impact will be less. But stunting reduction is expected to be adversely impacted for two reasons. Um, because of the income loss, people may not have been able to buy adequate food. One quarter of Indonesian households have faced food shortages during the pandemic because of reduced incomes. So this is affecting stunting and also the fact that some of the nutrition services have been disrupted, we can expect that the stunting progress is going to reduce. Then also on the education side, I mean, the government has provided access to free online learning platforms, and the government is also broadcasting educational TV programs. But we can expect that the student learning outcomes are going to decline during this time. I want to end on a on a somewhat uplifting note, if we can. You know, I'm sure Satu, you've you've lived all around the world. Tell me, you know, what's the best part of of working in Indonesia? What's the give us a reason to to get away from the doom and gloom? Give us give us the best part of Indonesia. Working for the World Bank is unique, and uh, I'm very privileged. Uh, to do so. But I also think that I have the best job in the World Bank working as a country director for Indonesia. And there are three reasons uh, why I think that's the case. First of all, um, in my view, in World Bank, you can make a difference. And in my job as a country director for Indonesia, I do have an opportunity to support changes on the ground, not just on paper. And that is very motivating. The second thing that I like uh, and what make uh, like about this job and what makes this so special um, is that every day is different. There are never dull days. Uh, every two days is different. I'm continuously learning something and I'm continually, continuously challenged. 
And I enjoy that because I love challenges. And the third reason why I specifically like this job is that I'm working with, with a group of highly talented and very skilled colleagues, which makes my, which make my job fun. And it is the combination of these three things, making a difference, being challenged and having fantastic colleagues that makes my job very enjoyable. That's a strong case for working at the World Bank. And, and you talked there about the, the privilege of learning something each day. The chance to learn about Indonesia through you has been fantastic. Thank you so much, Satya. Thank you. I'm You are watching the World Bank Group. Live once more with Pabsi Mariano here in Washington, D.C. And Pabsi, for about the past two weeks, we've been asking people to upload a photo to our digital mosaic, showing us what resilience means to them. Like I said, it's been open for about two weeks now. It's just been completed. We'll reveal it here in a second. How many photos make up this whole mosaic? So if you look at the mosaic, it's um, about 1,792 images. Okay, well, we'll look at that in a second. But you've been reviewing all the photos that have been submitted. Talk to me a little bit about some of them that have stood out to you. Sure. So across all these submissions, a common theme is a recognizing that nature is key to a sustainable recovery. So people submitted photos advocating for food security and agriculture. And then we've also seen photos showing what classrooms look like in their countries in this time of COVID-19. Honoring teachers has been front and center in these images. And then lastly, some shared photos acknowledging people that they've met and had a chance to capture those moments and inspire them. And, and what's been going through your mind as you've, as you've sort of been reviewing each of these one by one? As I see these photos, I think I remember the core of our mission. And those are our people, really, real lives. And um, it's about delivering results to make people's lives better. And, you know, coming together, all these photos coming together is one big thing. It, it reminds me of you know, what we can accomplish when we unite, even amid something like COVID-19. So, Without further ado, why don't you reveal the full mosaic for us? So now the mosaic is completed. You will see one image, one message, and it's resilient together. So we have to remember that these, uh, the mosaic is entirely made by photos submitted from across the world, from people of different cultures, backgrounds, languages. And if we think about it, the mosaic is a metaphor to our mission. And it echoes the message of everybody who spoke this week that a resilient recovery, the road to the resilient recovery still lies ahead, but the only way to get there is together. It's really just a lovely, lovely project. I think it's my favorite sort of social media project we've done over the past two weeks, and, and your sentiments are spot on. Um, as we close out here, this is the fifth and final day. We've had five days of events. If people want to watch any of it back, if they missed anything or they want to watch something again, how can they do it? Please go to World Bank Live to watch all the replays of all the events. You will also have session highlights on our YouTube channel, so please check that out. All right, Pabsi. Well, that's a wrap on the 2020 annual meetings. At the start of this week, I recalled how these meetings have taken place for around 75 years now. In normal times, thousands of people would be joining us here in the atrium to swap ideas, share research, and forge new professional relationships and friendships. This year, for the first time ever, we've met virtually. And despite the challenges and the pain of 2020, as these unique annual meetings draw to a close, we hope we've been able to inspire you by these conversations and these perspectives and these ideas that have been shared. We hope that we've given you a reason for optimism, that the groundwork has been laid for a resilient recovery to take hold quickly and effectively. Who knows what the World Bank IMF spring meetings in April will look like, but we will convene in person or online, and we look forward to those discussions and to having you with us physically or virtually. So with that, let me say that for all of us, stay safe, we'll see you soon, and goodbye from Washington. From Mexico City. In Athens, Greece. In Lome, Togo.
from Mexico City. It's in Athens, Greece. In Lome, Togo. 